All right, I think we can start. So welcome everybody to uh, this latest installment of the Canadian Bioplanics Workshop Series, uh, focusing on microbiome. Uh, welcome to Calgary. Um, just a first slide to let you know that all of the content that we're producing today is open source, uh, freely available under the Creative Commons license, so you're free to use any of it. Um, there's a um, directory website where you can access all the material. All of the um, lectures are going to be recorded, they're going to be available as well. Uh, so feel free to use and exploit any of this material uh, as you see fit. Uh, so um, this first lecture is, or this first module is really just kind of introduce, orient ourselves to the actual workshop. Um, so my name is John Parkinson. I'll introduce myself a little bit uh, later. First thing I need to do is a land acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7 located in the heart of Southern Alberta, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Pikani, uh, and Kainai First Nations, um, the Zutini uh, First Nation, and the Stony Nakuda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. Um, the city of Calgary is also home to Medis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Um, so what I'm going to cover in this very first kind of introduction, it's supposed to be just a short, just to get us all in the same wavelength, get us prepared about thinking about microbiome and a little bit of history. By the way, can you hear me at the back? You can't hear me at the back. So how about now? Is that helping? All right. So I might use or somebody might want to use the, there is a uh, microphone here, but if I just raise my voice, then that's good for you. Perfect. All right. Okay. So today it's just going to be a, um, in, or, or this morning, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the workshop, briefly discuss a little bit of history of the microbiome, studies of the microbiome, review some of the relevant terms so we're all on the same page, and then just finish with uh, kind of, a, I guess, more of a personal view of some of the challenges that we've been facing in microbiome studies, as well as some of the opportunities. Okay, so just to introduce you to the team, um, so Morgan at the back, uh, Google uh, refers to him as a person in a striped shirt. So give us a wave, Morgan. Okay, uh, we have Nia over there at the back and Sydney, who have done a tremendous job in um, organizing and setting up all of the logistics for the workshop. So fantastic, well done them. Uh, Ji Bin, is Ji Bin here? Okay, so Ji Bin, um, I should have put names on all of these, shouldn't I? Uh, <laughs> so Ji Bin, who has set up all the AWS um, services, uh, he's the guy at the top uh, with the cherry tree behind him. Uh, Robin, where are you, Robin? There you go, give a wave over, over there, Robin, who's one of our TAs. Uh, myself, John Parkinson. Uh, Laura, where's Laura? Oh, there's Laura, Laura Sakara at the back. Um, we have Ryan over there, another TA. Uh, Henna, hi, Henna. Uh, and Anita, who is going to be joining us, I think, on Thursday, uh, Friday. And then Kevin, where's Kevin? Okay, so Kevin, we'll introduce Kevin when he arrives. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Sydney, who's going to give us some important health and safety information. All right, uh, so most important, bathrooms. You leave any of these doors, turn right, head all the way to the end of the hallway where the elevators are, and then there's bathrooms over there. Uh, it's a little bit of a trek, sorry. Um, if there is an evacuation or any kind of emergency, leave these doors, turn left, go out the front door as you guys came in. Uh, basically follow me essentially, but you'll be going out, turning right, going around this building. And there's a building over there with an atrium right next to us that that is the assembly point if there is any kind of um, emergency evacuation. I think that's it. Oh, there was the... This bit, emergency instructions, but that was the emergency instructions. Those are the emergency instructions. If there is a tornado, um, <laughs> we're going to shelter in place right here. So don't be alarmed. 
Is that likely? Well, you hear there was one earlier this week. Okay, there will not be any tornadoes this week. Okay, so uh, just to orient you, you with the schedule. So kind of the format of this workshop is we'll do a kind of a one hour lecture before each module, and then you'll have two or three hours to work through uh, kind of uh, a prepared tutorial that is available online. Uh, and then we have the TAs uh, to help you work through that as well. So there will be a TA who will um, put the workshop up here, go through it, and then other TAs that are kind of roaming around and helping people who are getting stuck. So that's really the format. So in the in this first day after I've stopped um, going on, um, we are going to uh, start with Morgan's session, which is looking at uh, kind of 16S sequencing, and we have a 16S lab associated with that. And then this afternoon, we're going to be looking at some stats and visualization tools. Um, so today is really a 16S day uh, for those who are interested in 16S. So maybe um, raise your hands, those of you who are interested in 16S data. Okay, and raise your hands if you're interested in metagenomics data. Great, and raise your hands if you're interested in metatranscriptomics data. Okay, hopefully I'll be able to convince you on Friday that more of you should be doing metatranscriptomics. Um, so tomorrow, Thursday, uh, that's all day on metagenomics. Uh, so Morgan will be covering taxonomic functional annotations. And then Laura is going to be covering uh, metagenome assemblies, uh, generating mags and so forth. And then uh, on Friday, um, we, uh, myself and Ryan, will be presenting this kind of metatranscriptomic tutorial. And then in the afternoon, something that we've been introducing last few uh, kind of rounds of this workshop is on sample collection and how you go about designing clinical trials, because we found that participants find this aspect quite useful to hear, how do we go about designing a clinical trial? What do we need to worry about when we're collecting samples, maintain their integrity and make sure that we're minimizing the biases that are getting introduced in these kinds of, um, these kinds of studies. A new thing that we have just introduced this year, this June, is um, student intros. So one of the more rewarding aspects, I think, to us as instructors is actually learning more about what the landscape of microbiome research is out there. And so for us, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be introducing the work that we do. Uh, but we also want to hear about the work that you're doing. And it gives us, you know, a real good sense of what is happening in Canada in terms of uh, microbiome studies. So uh, there are these kind of flash talks where you're given three minutes uh, to kind of present uh, the kind of work that you're doing. And uh, I think that'd be the, one of the more fun aspects. It will hopefully really promote networking as well so that people, people who are working on similar problems, um, you can meet over lunch and discuss some of the challenges uh, that you've been facing or some of the opportunities that you've also been encountering as well. All right, so that's the schedule. Uh, so, um, just in context, just in that context of introducing ourselves and the work that we're doing, so to introduce work that goes on in my lab. So, my name is John Parkinson. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children. I'm also cross-appointed at the University of Toronto. Um, and research in my lab covers these kind of four areas. So, we're interested in pathogen host microbiome interaction. So, we're using parasites and looking at what happens when you infect people with parasites or mice with parasites. How does that impact the microbiome? Um, one study I'm really interested in uh, and excited by is this microbiome and malnutrition in pregnancy. So, this is in collaboration with the Aga Khan University in uh, Pakistan, where we're following. Uh, hundreds of young women and monitoring um, what happens over the course of their pregnancy, how their microbiome changes, what happens if they have low BMI versus high BMI. Uh, we're also involved in studies in pediatric IBD at sick kids. Um, and lastly, we work on chickens uh, because a few years ago I found out that it's a lot easier to get funding for chickens and chicken research than it is to get funded for uh, kids' research. 
Okay, so uh, just for this kind of second half of uh, this morning's introduction, I just want to just get us in the mood of microbiome and where we are with microbiome. Can you still hear me at the back, by the way? Wonderful. Okay, so um, uh, just this, get us all on the same page. Individual bacterial species, we know that they don't live in isolation, they actually form these kind of communities, these very complex microbial communities, and within these communities, bacteria are subject to a whole range of different interactions featuring competition, mutualism, even codependence. And from a human health perspective, we're seeing more and more um, kind of links with uh, diseases from IBD, diabetes, malnutrition, anorexia was one that came out recently. Um, so really, I think we're all kind of uh, on the same page. We're really kind of um, should all be evangelical about how microbiome is impacting everything. So again, can I get a raise of hands for those of you who are working in health, human health? Okay, and those of you who are working in non-health related areas. Okay, okay, that's great, that's great. We do have a little bit of a, a bent on, um, on, I guess, clinical and, and human health side of things, but um, overall we are kind of aware that microbiome does capture things beyond human health. Uh, and so we will be trying to place uh, kind of microbiome uh, outside health context. Okay, so we've seen a real explosion of microbiome studies in the last um, 15, 15 years or so. So this is just a graph from PubMed showing the number of publications with microbiome in the title. In 2007, there was only eight publications mentioned microbiome. And as we're all aware, this has really been driven by advances in sequencing technology. Uh, I pulled out, these were two of the first studies that mentioned microbiome in the title. So one was a review article in the current opinion in lipidology. That was the very first article that mentioned microbiome. Um, the second one was this one in science. Um, Jeff Gordon was involved in it. And this was a metagenome analysis. And here they use 16S sequencing as well as metagenomics uh, to study the distal gut um, microbiome of humans. Uh, and this was in the days when we didn't have this next generation sequencing. It was all done using this Sanger sequencing technology. Who's familiar with Sanger sequencing technology? Okay, so a few of you are, but most of you are not. I am not going to tell you about Sanger sequencing technology today, but it was very time consuming, very costly. And so one of the, one of the studies I kind of uh, enjoy presenting is this one. Does anyone know who this man up here is? Yes, it is. Well done. He, that is uh, Craig Venter. Uh, he was involved in the generation of the uh, private side of the Human Genome Consortium that was published back in 2001. He had this institute called the Institute for Genome Research, which was subsequently renamed as the J.C. Venter Institute, J.C.V.I. So it's not short of an ego. So once they'd done the uh, human microbiome, um, uh, sorry, the, the human genome, uh, they realized they had all this sequencing capacity. So what to do with all these Sanger machines that were not generating lots of sequence data, they could sequence more bacteria or whatever. Um, but Craig Benter has this yacht, it was uh, called Sorcerer 2, and he felt like going on a bit of an expedition with his yacht. So he sailed around, uh, I think the idea was to try and go around the world. I think he gave up when he got to Hawaii. And then every so often he'd dump a bucket over the side, drag up some water and then extract the DNA and then just sequence what was in there. So this was one of these first examples of metagenomics. He generated 7.7 .7 million sequencing reads, which was a huge number of sequencing reads in those days when we were using Sanger technology. There were these machines that would have uh, 96 capillaries and each of those capillaries would run one sequence. And that would be just one machine. So you'd have these banks of these machines doing this. So they're running 24 seven. Nowadays, you've got NovaSeq, Illumina, NovaSeq and so forth. And it just blows um, that Sanger sequencing out of the water. However, we didn't have that in those days. So what he did during those 7.7 .7 million sequencing reads, he found 6 million new genes. And just in terms of comparing this kind of NCBI, what was known in the NCBI, it was all dominated by eukaryotes. What he found in the seawater 
lots of bacteria. So it just shows, or it showed at the time, just how skewed our sequence representation was in these sequence data sets. Uh, one of the things he was very interested in was, um, uh, I guess, climate change used to be a thing back in 2006, 2007. We were concerned about climate change then. Uh, and so he was interested in these hydrogenases, uh, which were um, supposed to be uh, making the conversion of a lot of these biofuels much more efficient. And so he'd set this project, or one of the contexts he'd set this project for was trying to identify new enzymes that could uh, make these processes much more efficient. Um, so one of the things that's really driven microbiome research is really this idea of sequencing, right? So traditionally, microbiology, you were relying on doing culturing uh, to try and identify what was in your particular sample. Sequencing provides a route to identify what's in there, uh, particularly when bacteria can be challenging to isolate. And at the same time, by doing sequencing, you can also identify functions within that sample. However, the story is not as simple as that. So there's a colleague, uh, Mike Surette, who is at MapMaster, and he's really been promoting this idea of uh, culture-dependent sequencing or culture-enriched sequencing. And just in this top graph on the right here, the dark blue graph is what you get if you do culturing versus the orange, which is what you get if you do just sequencing. So I think this really shows that we shouldn't or we should acknowledge that maybe sequencing isn't getting at what is all within the sample. Maybe these kind of culture enrichment techniques can help tell us more about what is happening in our particular sample. So Mike's developed, I think it's a set of about 40 or so different uh, growth conditions, culture conditions that he will take a sample, plate that sample across those 40 conditions, grow the stuff up, grow the bugs up. And then in the, uh, in this bottom part, this inner ring, in kind of dark blue, this is what you get when you do your culture, when you do your culture enrichment. Uh, this outer ring is what you get when you do your sequencing and the inner ring with light gray is what you get that are shared between the two. So you can just capture way more when you're doing this kind of cultural enrichment. So it's, it's really, I think, quite compelling when we think about when we're doing a microbiome study what is it that we might be missing if we're just applying sequencing technology? So Mike reckons that he can recover using these culture conditions more than 95% of the taxa in any given sample. Uh, okay, definitions. Uh, this is so that we are all familiar with um, the terms that we're using when we describe microbiome. So mi microbiome is a collection of genetic material within an environment. I think people use it interchangeably with the set of microbes in an environment, but it's really, originally, it was really focused on the collection of the genetic material. The microbiota are the set of microbes that are found in the environment, uh, metagenome, collection of genomes within an environment. Important to distinguish that metagenomics is not the same as 16S surveys. So those are two very different things. Metatranscriptome, collection of the transcripts within an environment, and then marker gene surveys. So this is where we're doing an amplification sequencing of a targeted region that can act as a molecular barcode. So one of the early studies that was using uh, the 16S kind of approach was this one from a colleague, Dan Frank, published 2008. Healthy individual, individual with IBD, looking at the microbiome in the colon, you can see that the individual with IBD, very, very different. But the problem with these kind of 16S studies as time has gone on is that we don't know if this is cause or correlation, um, whether the uh, messed up microbiome of the IBD individual is really due to the disease or whether it's causing the disease. So we're probably all aware now, those, those of you that are doing the metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, that uh, there's more and more emphasis in terms of uh, publishing and so forth to get more at the core, these kind of causal mechanistic relationships. Uh, and so we're putting more and more of this workshop, kind of devoting it more in terms of metagenomics. And we're kind of shying a little bit away from 16S. That's not saying that 16S doesn't have a place. I think it's incredibly useful because it's cheap um, to actually fill in the gaps because metagenomics, as you know, it's very expensive um, and you can only selectively deploy it to certain sets of samples. 
Whereas you might want to fill in the gaps in between and make sure that nothing has really changed at dramatic time points in, in your uh, particular data sets. Um, so given this kind of cause correlation, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, these are really starting to take off, maybe metagenomics more, um, as a way of providing more functional insights, mechanistic insights into what's happening within a microbiome. This is, uh, again, one of my favorite studies to show, 2012 from the Human Microbiome Consortium. This is 112 individuals, about nine different body sites, and the top graph shows what taxa are present in each of these individuals in each of these body sites, and they're very varied. So everybody has a very varied set of organisms that um, are present in each of these body sites, but when you look at the actual functions, in this case it was keg metabolic pathways, these same communities all give you a similar breakdown of um, different functions. So this is suggesting maybe the community doesn't really matter in terms of who's there, it's actually what they are actually doing which is important. Uh, in terms of where does our microbiome come from, how do microbiomes um, develop? So the human microbiome, it changes as we age and um, uh, I apologize for not putting the citation of this uh, review here. Uh, but the idea is that um, there are dramatic changes from birth up to about three years of age. Um, and it's funny that they left it at three years of age. So I was discussing with Morgan last night that there is very little data concerning the adolescent microbiome. The adolescent microbiome, I think, is traditionally thought of as being very similar to the adult microbiome, but nobody's really looked. And so, again, this is one of the interests that I have in terms of trying to look at what really happens in that kind of critical uh, point in our development. Um, one thing I want to emphasize, some of the main contributors in terms of what uh, initiates our microbiome, mode of delivery is probably the number one um, kind of component that has the largest impact on our developing microbiome. Uh, modes of uh, feeding as well uh, has a large impact as well as antibiotics, obviously. One of the factors that does not seem to have an impact on a developing infant microbiome is the placenta. And the reason I bring this up is kind of a cautionary tale so that we can be aware when we're doing these microbiome studies, how we interpret these data sets and make sure that we are performing them um, in manners where we can actually um, be confident about the conclusions that we're drawing. So this was a study, who's familiar with this story of the prep of the placental microbiome? Okay, just one of you. Okay, great. Um, so this was a study that was published in Science Translational Medicine 2014. Uh, so the researcher collected placenta from 320 subjects under sterile conditions, performed 16S and metagenomics sequencing. And they did these kind of correlation studies and they found that the placental microbiome is similar to the oral microbiome. Okay, so there's this idea that somehow the microbes in your mouth were maybe somehow getting into your placenta. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, claims and um, extrapolations from these kind of results. So, um, there was uh, a, a, a kind of a review of, of this particular study, and they mentioned that this re-emphasizes re the importance of oral health during pregnancy. And in fact, women may need to pay attention to their teeth even before they may become pregnant because the placenta develops early in pregnancy. This may be a challenge for low-income women who can't afford dental care. Okay, so this is from the actual author and it's kind of like, whoa, this sounds really important. And yet these are young, these are women, potentially young women who are already uh, demonized by society. And yet you're giving them another stick to beat them with, uh, which is where you've got to maintain your, your oral health to make sure you have a healthy baby. So there's a lot of this kind of extrapolation from this one study. But at no point in this study was there any link between periodontal disease with the placental microbiome. And the other thing they found was only DNA sequence was detected. There was no live bacteria. So there's a lot of kind of extrapolation of what the implications of this research was, which went way beyond what the study actually said. And in fact, two years later, there's a study which looked at doing um, controls 
and basically taking air swabs or swabs of kits and looking at the ketones. So what happens if you just sequence from the kit or from the air, what do you get? And they found that the placental microbiome was indistinguishable from these controls, from these air swabs and so forth. Um, so this is really quite a damning uh, kind of indication of how a microbiome research can really go off the rails. And even today, we have a certain community of research who are convinced that there's a placental microbiome out there, despite all of these studies. And I think there was one that came out uh, a couple of months ago, which uh, definitively said there is no placental microbiome, and yet it still kind of persists. So when we're doing our microbiome studies, we have to be a little bit cautious about how do we interpret our results and do the conclusions really, are they really supported by the data? Okay, so I'm just going to finish with a couple of slides on what I personally think might be some of the more interesting challenges and opportunities. So looking at quantification, for example, uh, hands up those of you who are now uh, trying to control for quantification in your samples. Okay, okay, interesting. So we're seeing more and more of a push for by publications or reviewers suggesting that we need to start thinking about controlling for absolute versus relative quantification. So if we think about our sequencing, we know we're always going to get 100% reads because it's all relative. So in terms of relative abundance, you might say that this red taxon is in a higher abundance in this particular sample versus this particular sample. However, when we control for absolute abundance, we find that they're actually the same. So there's a number of ways that we can quantify our samples. And there are spiking controls, for example. There's cell counting methods. But increasingly, we need to think about how do we control for the absolute abundance within our data sets. Metabolomics. How many of you are doing metabolomics or incorporating some aspect of metabolomics? OK, just. Uh, Four, four or five years. Okay, interesting. So um, as we're starting to focus in on the functional potential of a microbiome, we need to come up with kind of orthogonal data sets that can help confirm some of these kind of conclusions. Metabolomics is one way of doing that, uh, where we can look at what's happening in terms of metabolic pathways within a particular microbiome. Does that correlate with the metabolites that we see within a particular sample? And the generation or the integration of these kind of metabolomics data sets brings up another challenge, which is how do we integrate all of these different data sets? So we've got microbiome data, we might have uh, some biomarker data, other biomarker data, we might have metabolomics data, we might have some uh, human genomic or genetic data, and we might have chart reviews as well. So how do we integrate all of those different data sets to come up with how do we determine which of these factors? What are the contributions of each of these different factors on health outcomes? And I think there's a real need for methods um, to kind of take these kind of data sets, which um, they're really not in a very mature kind of, um, um, they're not very mature at the moment, the, these kind of methods. And so there's a real need, there's a real opportunity for developing new methods that does a better route of doing statistics and these kind of data integration. And this is potentially where modeling can help, okay? So uh, there's tools now that enable you to model uh, metabolic interactions within your bacterial community. So you can do your sequencing, you do your metagenomics, you can build these models where you're starting to look at metabolic uh, interactions within your data set. And that can tell you something and help make predictions as to what happens if I alter this microbiome? What happens if I bring in this dietary additive? What happens if I add in this organism? How does that impact the community? And I think that modeling we're going to see uh, in the next two or three years, uh, more, more and more of these studies that are using modeling to help interpret these data sets. And then finally, um, particularly for, for a human health or an animal health or one health perspective, uh, the opportunities that we're seeing at the moment is how do we go about modulating the microbiome? And so uh, there's a number of different kind of products that have been created. So there's phage, there's prebiotics, probiotics, organic acids, enzymes. Probably a lot of the focus, I think, especially given the success of these fecal microbiome transplants is really on the generation of these complex communities. But the challenge is how do we best define and identify which of these products are most likely to be effective? 
And again, this is where these kind of microbiome studies can come in. This is potentially where modeling can help as well.